Hi guys, and welcome back. Today is a casting day, yay! I'm super excited. I haven't done a, just a full regular cast in a little while. I think the last time I did it was before we went to Japan, so it has been a minute. Today, I'm just gonna take you guys through the casting process with me. I'm going to just do a really small cast. I'm doing a uh, link from a bracelet that I am making, and also I'm gonna cast one of the little cowrie shells that we made a mold of before. So one thing I definitely am planning on doing today is at this point, I have been using both my kiln and my three-in-one vacuum cast over here and the little vacuum pump that I bought to attach to it to make the whole thing work. At this point, I have been using all of these things for a couple of months now, and I think I want to give you guys just a little update on kind of some of the quirks that come along with using these machines. I do want to just keep you guys posted on how they're still working today. Also, I love when you guys ask me questions. I do always try, like, once a week to sit down and answer. I am going to actually take a few minutes today and I just want to answer some of the questions that I get most commonly or there's a couple questions you guys ask that are in the same vein and so I have some notes and we're just going to go through all those questions and I'm going to try to bring a little bit of clarity. Just one more quick reminder, I am not an expert. Please don't take everything I'm saying as gospel or anything like that. I make mistakes. There's room for me to be wrong. I'm just sharing my experience. Every time I do this, I am sending a prayer up that I am not, you know, maiming myself or exploding my garage. <laughs> Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. First, I make the pieces I want to cast out of wax. You can use resin or PLA if you're 3D printing, but you'll still need to sprue up your pieces like this to cast them, meaning you'll attach them to a thicker center piece of wax using thinner pieces of wax like branches on a little tree. Weigh all of your wax, then melt the wax a little at the base where it meets the rubber. This keeps it from moving around before the investment is solid. I always take a little brush and clean my pieces with some 99% alcohol. This keeps my pieces free from dust and debris and helps prevent bubbles from forming on the items. Next, I attach my flask to the rubber sprue base. You want to make sure your items are fairly centered, not too close to the walls. Since this is full of holes, I'm going to have to put some tape around the outside to keep the investment from spilling. I like my tape a little higher on the top of the flask so that the investment doesn't make a mess as it rises in the vacuum. I would also suggest that you overlap the tape a little bit to make sure the investment stays put. I am not a morning person. I'm pretty sure my second brain cell doesn't even wake up until about noon. So pro tip here is to measure your water and powder the night before so it's ready for you in the morning. You'll add your powder to your water, then mix them together. Very important, you will only have about eight minutes total working time as per the investment instructions. So in my opinion, a cheap hand mixer is a must. Once the powder touches the water, the clock starts. So I would recommend starting a timer on your watch or phone. You have four minutes to mix your bowl, one minute to vacuum the mixing bowl, one minute to pour into the flask, then two minutes to vacuum the flask. Feel free to give a little shake while you're vacuuming to help the bubbles rise to the top. I like to tilt my flask a little bit and pour to the side so that I can avoid pouring directly on my piece since it's very important that it stays in place. If you want to know how much investment to mix based on the size of your flask, I'll drop a link in the description for you. I let this sit for 90 to 120 minutes. After that, it will be solid and ready for the kiln. Peel off the tape and remove the rubber sprue base. I'm using some ceramic pieces to hold the flask up, but you could also use pieces of steel or anything that can withstand high temps. Once the flask goes in, we start our 13 hour burnout process. This is not placed directly on the floor of the kiln because I want to give the wax space to evaporate out of the bottom. At the final stage, I'll decrease my kiln temp to 600 degrees Celsius. When my kiln's at about 650 degrees Celsius, I go ahead and add silver to the crucible and set my melting temperature. The temp may be a little different for you depending on what metal you're using. Once your burnout's complete and your metal's to temp, it's time to see if you wasted 13 hours or not. Please, for the love of all that is good, do not forget to turn the vacuum casting chamber on before pouring your silver. I did that on my first cast and seriously wanted to cry. That's what's helping the metal pull downward, so it's super important. Yay! Hey, I'm not the best at pouring, but I think this went awesome. I usually spill silver everywhere, so I'll call this a win. After you see that the metal is no longer red, you can fully submerge your flask in water to quench. Let it hang out in the bucket for a while until you don't see bubbles anymore. Looks like we got it. Oh yeah. This is the best time to clean the investment off of your piece. I found that the longer you wait, the harder it is to get off. Well. You know, I feel pretty good about that. Let's get these cleaned up. And then I am gonna go ahead and cut these loose of the sprue 
and I'm gonna throw these in the pickle. Quick note, it's important to think about where you're placing the sprue when you're prepping your wax piece because it could make cleanup harder later. I'm just gonna file down the areas where the sprue was attached and toss these into the tumbler for a bit. I have just enough water to cover the shot and about a cap full of burnishing compound. I will go ahead and answer some of the questions that I get most commonly. So first of all, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my burnout schedule. I did not come up with that burnout schedule. What I'm doing in the kiln with the investment powder and the wax, that is based on the manufacturer's suggested burnout. Right now, I am using Prestige Optima powder, which everything I talk about, I will link in the description below. And the burnout schedule that I'm using using is part of the instructions with the burnout powder. And I think it's relatively the same for a lot of the different powders you use. I could not remember which powder we used in school, but I do remember it being a long burnout process. So I think they're all kind of similar. This is a 13 hour burnout. That's just the burnout. That doesn't account for me mixing up the investment powder and letting that sit for an hour and a half. Usually when I start this process, I start at like 6 a.m. But the burnout schedule is really just me ramping up to a certain temperature and then holding that temperature for a certain amount of time. And then we ramp up and then we burn out for a certain amount of time. I think some people have some issues with their cast because they want to ramp it up high and fast. And really, I think in this case, you just have to be patient so that the cast comes out nicely. I have not really seen anybody have success just like ramping it up to 750 for a shorter amount of time. Quick note, you can buy the uh, investment powder from, you know, a place like Rio. There's a lot of other suppliers that sell investment powder. Depending on how much you're getting and where you live and what shipping costs, I actually found that it was a little bit cheaper to purchase the same powder on eBay. But if you buy it on a place like eBay, you may not see the instructions included. I'll link down below to the instructions for my specific powder. A lot of times you can just go onto the manufacturer website and they will actually have the burnout schedule posted for you. I know that there are different investment powders that are better for different applications. For example, if you're using resin, I believe plastic cast might be a better situation, but I have not used resin and done a burnout with resin yet. So I don't know that, but I just wanted to throw that out there to kind of get you on your way Google wise. All right, I want to also talk about when I am pouring my metal. So the very last kind of plateau of burnout in the kiln, I am at 750 degrees Celsius. When I am in that last little section, I then go down and I decrease the temperature to 600 degrees Celsius. That is the temperature of my flask. While I am decreasing the temperature of the flask in the kiln, that's usually when I will come over to my vacuum cast machine that has the melting furnace in it. And I will go ahead and put my silver in while the machine is cold. And I will turn the machine to 965. I have occasionally cranked it up to 970 degrees Celsius. I do that because I'm a very slow pourer. And obviously, the longer the crucible is away from the heating element, the temperature is gonna drop. So I don't want to set it at 965 and then I'm actually pouring at like 940 or something like that because I'm like jittery and like slowly pouring. I'm getting a little faster though. I'm getting a little better. You know, practice makes perfect to all my slow pourers out there. Okay, someone was asking what wax I use. I am using, let me pull it out. I don't know why I'm trying to use my goldfish brain. I have a big old block of blue Ferris wax. I don't know that much about wax other than um, in terms of me creating things wax wise, I have pretty much always used the blue hard wax. I think it keeps the shape and the definition really well. It's easy for me to build up. I'm pretty sure this one's from Rio. I also have Ferris sprue wax. Now these are the big chunk monsters. These are the ones that I use for the base of my tree. And then I use the other wax to make the little branches of the tree. And this one is three eighths of an inch in diameter. And that fits perfectly into my rubber base of the flask. Then I'm using Modeler's Red Sprue Wax. This is eight gauge. There we go. And this is the little red wax that you'll see me use to attach to that yellow wax. And then from these pieces, I'll attach the actual thing that I made. Maybe it's PLA, maybe it's the wax shape that I made. So if you don't wanna use wax, you can also do a 3D print burnout. Like I said before, I don't really have any experience burning out resin, but I use my Bamboo A1 Mini 3D printer and I use just basic PLA in order to print a piece. And then we did the burnout and I think that came out 
out really well. I was really happy with that. So a couple of people have asked me about the kiln specifically. I am using the Vever kiln and I paid really in that $400 range for this. Editing Lauren will correct me if I'm wrong, but I paid about $400. I purchased it on eBay. I wanted to buy it through eBay because it's cheaper than other kilns and I was a little suspicious and I was like, you know what, if it doesn't work, then I know there's like a eBay money back guarantee or whatever and I could get my money back. I bought it and then made an effort to try to use it before I was out of that return period. So I would suggest that to you if you're also nervous. But so far I haven't had any issues with it. I really like the kiln. A couple people asked me different versions of the same question. And that is how long can you maintain the temperature of the kiln, the max temperature? The temperature that I have done right now is 750 degrees Celsius. I have not tried to go higher than that because I haven't needed to. That is the max temperature for my burnout schedule. And I have primarily only used this to burn out wax and PLA for casting silver. I have not had any issues. I can hear the fan blowing. It doesn't take up a big footprint. I'm really happy with it for the price. If it explodes or breaks down, I'm definitely gonna let everybody know that that's what happened. But so far, so good. Someone said, does the kiln get hot on the outside? Yeah, I mean, a little bit, but not that bad. I don't give it like a big hug or anything while it's at 750. Yeah, I can touch it on the outside. It's not that bad, but I mean, I wouldn't recommend snuggling up to it, but I would also advise you to keep the area around it clear. I'm in a really small space, so I'm kind of limited on that, but otherwise I just make sure not to surround it in like dryer lint and dry hay. <laughs> Someone also asked me a question about ventilation. So where I am at is very, very hot, inhospitable to doing this outside. <laughs> so I have it on a table in my garage. While I'm doing the burnout process, I usually will have the garage kind of partially open and then I will have a fan going. There is no, someone asked if there was smoke. There is no smoke. When I'm doing the wax burnout, there is a little bit of an odor, which is another reason I make sure that I have some airflow. There is a ventilation hole in the top of the kiln. Maybe the very, very first burnout that I ever did with this, I saw a little bit of wispy something coming out of the top. That might've just been maybe something inside the kiln from shipping. So then I've also got questions about when using the PLA, does that really just burn out or some questions about catching the wax in the kiln as it's coming out. So I just want to re-explain the process just a little bit. So what we're doing, we make the wax shape and then the shape is on the bottom and we pour the investment around the shape. So when we're doing the burnout in the kiln and then we're creating a negative cavity to pour the metal into. So the wax and the PLA, what happens is I make sure to leave enough space so that it can evaporate. 750 degrees Celsius is pretty toasty. So there's not going to be any residue or anything like that in there. When I pull out the flask and am done doing the burnout, it's clean in there. There's nothing in there. So hopefully I explained that okay and that clarified a few things for you. So I'm going to move on to the vacuum cast machine. Now this one I paid about 430 bucks for and that included tax and shipping costs. So it wasn't a used machine. It was a new machine. I just purchased it on eBay again because it looked cheaper than other machines. I have not had any issues with this. So somebody mentioned that they had issues with the control knob and I will say it is difficult to turn. Actually, the first and second and probably even third cast I did with this, I was nervous that this didn't work. And I will say I really had to put my back into it. It has gotten a little easier with use. It doesn't feel like it's wearing out or anything like that, but it does feel like it is now used to being turned. When I have it in the um, actual vacuum portion here with the dome, it's slightly difficult to turn, but it's not that bad. Really when I have it in the casting chamber in the back here and I'm about to pour the metal, that is when I actually have to like brace one hand on the table and put my back into that a little bit because it, it is just a little difficult to turn. You did get a machine that's broken. I don't doubt that at all. That's totally possible. It's not like these are coming from, I mean, I don't know where these are coming from. When I bought this machine, I was like, it felt like some Timu garbage, right? <laughs> it actually is a pretty good machine. Um, I just want to put that out there in case you take a leap of faith and you try to turn it and you think the knobs are broken they might just be difficult to turn or you can have broken knobs. So just give it a try. Also, I want to say someone reminded me to not use uh, flux or borax with 
the crucible. You should not use blocks with a graphite crucible and I totally forgot that. So I just wanted to say that to the world in case you watched what I did and then didn't know that I made a mistake. So I just want to clarify that. And whoever left that comment to, to let me know, thank you so much for that. That was super helpful and I felt dumb that I forgot. But you could damage your crucible if you do that. So not in a graphite crucible. This doesn't come with a vacuum. If you buy just this machine, it will not work in terms of the vacuum function. You have to purchase a separate vacuum pump. The vacuum pump that I bought was honestly the cheapest thing I saw on Amazon. And so far so good. I haven't had any issues with it. Um, oh, I will say with the kiln, I still have not found any way to change from Celsius to Fahrenheit. I don't believe that's possible, but I don't really care because it hasn't created any issues for me at all. And the instructions on my investment powder are listed in Celsius. So there's no reason to do math when there's no reason to do math. I would buy the kiln again. It is a cheaper option to some of the more expensive kilns out there. The only real issue with this is that it's not programmable, right? With a programmable one, I believe you're able to just tell it when to ramp up and when to ramp down. And with this, every time I have to make a change in the burnout schedule, I actually have to come inside and manually change the temperature. Also, it's not great to just sh shoot up to a high temperature and just to be extra cautious. For example, the first part of this burnout tells you to, over the course of an hour, go up to 150 degrees Celsius. Well, I don't have any way of telling this machine that because it doesn't have a brain you'll see me do this is I will actually put it at like 75 degrees Celsius first and then I will wait for it to hit that and then I'll ramp it up to 150. And so that for me is a better way to make sure that we're spreading out that temperature a little more evenly, not being programmable. Really the only negative that I can see. Would I today spend the extra money on the programmable kiln over this? No, probably not. I'm cheap. <laughs> And then when it comes to the three in one vacuum cast, I really have not had any issues. I would say you might notice I have a different hose on here. I would say the red hose that comes with it is a little trash. If you can go and get a slightly smaller hose, if I remember the size of this hose, I'll tell you. This hose in particular that I replaced the red hose with, I think is from some Harbor Freight kit. If I find it, I'll link the kit. It was only a couple bucks. Whatever it was was not expensive, but this was a better fitting hose than the red one that came with it originally. And then these little plastic clamps that they give you that are supposed to take the place of like a good metal clamp, I would recommend you throwing those away <laughs> and just get some steel hose clamps. Just get those because you really want to make sure that at every junction where this is, you have a nice tight seal. There's here where the hose connects into the machine. And then there's where there's the filter on the line. Those have hose clamps, hose clamps. And then I used a little Teflon tape and that got me a really good seal. I was really concerned about not having enough vacuum pressure to get the bubbles out of the investment. Before I did these changes, I was kind of stuck maybe like 20, 22 after making the changes. Now I'm in that probably like 27 to 29. Having nice tight seals really is going to help you out with this machine. Otherwise, I don't have any complaints with really anything that I purchased. I think these are great and I am very happy with them. So please feel free to ask me any other questions. I'm pretty sure there's some stuff I forgot to mention. So I think these came out pretty good. I am particularly happy and pleased with my cowrie shell. So this was just a little link in a chain I'm going to make. Just a little rough draft, but I think it came Came out really cute. My shining glory here is gonna be this cowrie shell, but it got the outside really nice and shiny and smooth. But the inside I think could use a little cleanup. So I think moving forward, I am going to clean up the inside first before I throw it in the tumbler because I think my little polishing wheels will do a, a pretty good job cleaning that up. I feel like this was a big success. If you managed to make it to the end of the video, thank you so much. I hope that this was helpful for you. I know today was just kind of a reiteration of things that I've done in the past, but I feel like I did get enough like similar questions that maybe I didn't do the best job explaining. So hopefully I did a better job. <laughs> Let me know what your setup is. I'm really kind of curious what you guys are working with. That's going to be all for me today. I will see you guys in the next one. Go forth, be kind, be creative.